Temperature is a measure of hotness. Now we're gonna ask ourselves, how hard is it to make something hotter? And how hard is it to make something colder? First of all, imagine an object and its surroundings. The object could either gain heat or lose heat. Heat could be transferred from the surroundings to the object, and in that case the sign of heat is positive, which means heat gained by the object. Or vice versa, the object could lose heat to the surroundings, that means the heat would be a negative quantity. In the first case, the object will reach a higher temperature than it originally had. In the second case, it would reach a lower temperature. So if we define delta T as final temperature minus initial temperature, in the first case we'll have a positive delta T, in the second case we'll have a negative delta T. That means that mathematically the heat exchanged between the object and the surroundings has the same sign of the temperature change for the object. The amount of energy required to increase the temperature of an object is proportional to its heat capacity and to the desired temperature change in Kelvin. That means that Q must be proportional to delta T. The proportionality constant is called heat capacity. The heat capacity C is in turn the product of two independent factors, little c, the specific heat, which is a material dependent property, and m, the mass of the object. The specific heat of a material measures the energy per unit mass required to increase the temperature by 1 Kelvin. Accordingly, the units are joules per kilogram per Kelvin. If we like, we could also call specific heat a specific heat capacity, meaning heat capacity per unit mass. Here is a table of specific heat capacities for notable materials. You can immediately see that water ranks among the highest with more than 4000 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. Here's an example. Ice has a density of 917 kilograms per meter cube. Some 1.5 centimeter side ice cubes are in your freezer, which is normally set to keep its temperature at negative 4 Celsius. By accident, you now change the setting to negative 10 Celsius. How much energy will each icicle lose in order to reach thermal equilibrium? Of course, the heat will be lost to the freezer, and one can argue that the freezer will actually gain heat in this process. We are not directly given the mass of ice, so we'll have to find that. We're actually given the volume because we know the shape is a cube with a given side, so the volume is just the side cubed. So using this expression for the mass, density times volume times specific heat capacity times temperature change. We need to look up the specific heat capacity of ice, that is 2030 joules per kilogram per Kelvin, and the density is given above, that is actually a negative 6 Kelvin, which means that the energy will be lost so we should find a negative value, negative 37.7 joules. In the previous example we hinted at the fact that if you put a hot object inside a freezer, that freezer will gain energy. If there was no mechanism by which the excess energy was removed, then that freezer interior would actually increase its temperature. If instead of a freezer we had considered a thermos container that doesn't allow exchange of heat with the surroundings, then the situation would have been quite different. If a system cannot exchange energy with the surroundings, that is, if it's isolated, in physics jargon, all the heat exchanges until thermal equilibrium is reached must add up to zero. Heat gained has a positive sign, heat lost has a negative sign, you could say the sum of all the heat exchanges, that is C1 and 1 delta T1 plus C2 and 2 delta T2, plus C3 and 3 delta 3, 3 and so on, must add up to zero. So if you have three initially separated objects, you put them in thermal contact and isolate the boundaries of the system so it doesn't exchange energy with the outside, then the heat exchanges between 1, 2 and 3 must add up to zero. So overall, the system doesn't gain or lose energy. This is really a generalization of the principle of conservation of energy. Here's an example. 
A hot 25 kg steel sword is entirely immersed in 8.5 kg of cold water, whose initial temperature is 10 Celsius degrees. Neglect heat exchanges with the surrounding air. Temperature of water rises to 52 Celsius degrees by the time thermal equilibrium is attained. Find the initial temperature of the sword. Since we are neglecting the heat exchanges with the surroundings, we are treating the system of steel sword and water in the tub as an isolated system, so all heat exchanges must add up to zero. The algebraic sum of the heat lost by the sword plus the heat gained by the water must be equal to zero. Mind you, Qs is a negative quantity, whereas Qw is a positive quantity. So Qs equals minus Qw. We looked up the specific heat capacity of water and that of steel and we can actually write specific heat capacity of steel, mass of steel, delta T steel, temperature change for the sword equals negative C water M water delta T water. Now delta T water is positive 42 degrees Celsius but that is the same as writing 42 Kelvin and we want to find the temperature change for the steel so solving for delta T S negative C water M water delta T water divided by C steel M steel plugging in the numbers where C W M W over C S M S is roughly 3.15 we get negative 132 Kelvin or Celsius because it's a temperature difference so let's just write Celsius degrees so the initial temperature of the sword was 132 degrees above its final temperature so the answer is 52 degrees plus 132 degrees which is 194 Celsius degrees. Alright, here's a question for you.